I look like Sam. I decided to stay up. Just a country lawyer. <laughs> Sam Irvin, I like that. Just a country lawyer. Just a country, country lawyer. lawyer. Yes. Call the roll. Mr. Bartell. Present. Regent Bradley. Here. Regent Burmaster. Here. Regent Conley Kiesler. Here. Regent Crane. Here. Regent Keene. Here. Regent Davis. Here, here, present. Here. Regent Pruitt. Here. Regent Randall. Regent Rosenzweig. Regent Salas. Here. Regent Seminus. Here. Regent Seminus. Here. Regent Smith. Here. Regent Beckers. Here. Regent Wall. Here. Quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, the minutes of the October 5 and 6, 2000 meeting held in Flatville, Wisconsin have been distributed. Are there any corrections or additions? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Approved. You have the report of the October 20, 2006 meeting of the Educational Communications Board. Are there any questions or comments? And I remind you that the board's Representative is Regent Eileen Conley Kiesler. Seeing no comments, uh, you also have the report of the August 29 and August, uh, October 13, 2006 meeting of the Higher Educational Aids Board. The um, are there any questions or comments? And I remind you that the board's representative is Regent Milton McPike. Seeing none, you have the report of the uh, November 8, 2006 meeting of the Hospital Authority Board. The board's representatives are at that meeting were Regents Rosenzweig and Smith, and Regents uh, Milt McPike is also a member, but uh, wasn't present because we hadn't announced that, and I apologize, Milt. Um, any questions about that report? <coughs> Moving on, you have the report of the October 24, 2006 special meeting of the Wisconsin Technical College System Board. Are there any questions or comments? And I remind you that the board's representatives are Regents Burmaster, Keene, Rosenzweig, and Smith. Seeing no comments. Last week, Governor Doyle signed a proclamation designating November 13th through the 17th as International Education Week to coordinate with a joint designation of International Education Week made by the United States Department of Education and the State Department. The purpose is to celebrate the benefits of international education and exchange. Uh, Regent Davis will say more about the subject in her Education Committee report. The proclamation reads as follows. Yes, sir. Whereas, whereas our nation's population is among the world's most diverse, with citizens and immigrants from nearly every nation, culture, and background, including many people from all corners of the globe who live, work, and study in Wisconsin, and whereas technological advances affecting international trade, communications, and travel continue to make our world smaller and increase opportunities for interaction among people from dis different societies, cultures, and nations, and whereas international security, respect for democracy, and appreciation of others begin with the education and the exchange of knowledge between students, scholars, and members of the public, and whereas international education promotes the sharing of ideas and experiences, encourages students and citizens to participate in study abroad opportunities, citizen and scholarly exchanges, and area and foreign language studies fosters friendships and understandings between U.S. citizens and citizens from around the world and prepares U.S. citizens to live, work, and compete in the global economy. And whereas about 5,500 international students study at UW system institutions, <coughs> Wisconsin private colleges, and Wisconsin technical colleges each year over 
5,900 students from Wisconsin post-secondary institutions participate in study abroad programs, and international students and scholars come to Wisconsin from over 100 countries. And whereas the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education began this joint initiative in two, the year 2000 as part of an effort to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences in the United States. Now, therefore, I, Jim Doyle, Governor of the State of Wisconsin, do hereby proclaim November 13 through 17, 2006, as International Education Week in Wisconsin and urge our citizens to celebrate the benefits of international education and exchange and in testimony wherever I have set my name to this sealed state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, the President's uh, report will be brief. Uh, I have not made any more additional appearances uh, in the last month since Platteville. Um, but, however, l let me report on, on activity since the election of last Tuesday. I have spoken with the new Majority Leader of the uh, State of Wisconsin Senate, and she has assured me that they will, in the first week of January, address the confirmation of the remaining ten regions. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have received no promises of confirmation. <laughs> but we will finally get moving forward at least with some decisions. And, and uh, I should also add that in caucus yesterday, she indicated that was their initial and primary responsibility to be handled immediately. Um, today is a special day because we, uh, this is a day that uh, we honor uh, teaching awards and the 2006 Regents Teaching Excellence Awards will be uh, presented later in the morning. Um, we also hopefully will at the end of the day have a new Chancellor in La Crosse and I think you'll be excited about uh, what you hear there. It's a compliment to this system and particularly to the UW lacrosse for uh, given the, the kind of people that sought that job and, and the results that we have. Um, a final thing I wanted to mention is that as our challenge moves forward to convince the decision makers to reinvest in higher education, um, I, I think Tuesday uh, clearly sent a message to the decision makers that people care about higher education in Wisconsin. And you can look around the state and the kind of vote that took place, and I think you can find a lot of messages about the public saying that education is important. Um, President Riley will comment on that later, but this leaves us all with a continuing challenge, uh, and not just as a group, but individually to contact the decision makers of both parties and continue to persuade them that the growth initiative, the covenant, and that access to higher education in the state of Wisconsin is very important. And if we're going to compete in the knowledge economy, we must get this engine going faster and faster, and we must grow, and we must serve the public. And I think it's time that we repeat that message over and over, because I think it's getting traction. I certainly felt that as I traveled the state the previous month and spoke with seven rotaries. I think the public has uh, told the decision makers that last Tuesday, and now it's our job to continue to carry that message. We have a lot to be proud of. We've got a great team. We've got a group of chancellors like we've never had before, and I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and momentum. So that's our challenge, and I likewise challenge each of you. This time, I'd like to um, turn the podium over to President Riley for his report and introductions. Thank you. Thank you, President Walsh, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we recognize today that tomorrow is Veterans Day, um, and many of you, I think, will recall that on Veterans Day last year, I described how Wisconsin veterans are part of the bedrock of this university system. In, in fact, uh, much of what the UW system is today is the result of that enormous new set of social policies called the GI Bill of Veterans' Rights, which since its inception in 1944 has helped hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Wisconsin veterans attend college. 
The GI Bill changed America by changing its universities. The influx of veterans exploded small universities into huge places of opportunity for people from all walks of life across the country. It expanded UW-Madison into one of the largest campuses and top research universities. It helped grow the UW system to 26 campuses. And Wisconsin remains today a real leader in honoring and assisting its veterans. This board has been a strong proponent of Wisconsin veterans as they return home from their current service, supporting as you have the new Wisconsin GI Bill, which provides free tuition for all qualifying veterans to recognize their sacrifices. I'm pleased to introduce now one of our key partners in this new Wisconsin GI Bill effort, John Skokos, the Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome, John. Among other achievements, Secretary Skokos is a veteran with more than 26 years of active and reserve military service with the U.S. Army, including duty overseas and stateside. John's also a veteran of the educational ranks as well holding degrees and certificates from Truro University, Mankato State, and the UW-Madison. He's a graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, the Duke University Governor's Executive Program, and numerous military courses with the U.S. Army. Secretary Skokos and I are preparing to make joint calls on members of the legislature to ask that the state provide adequate GPR support for the new Wisconsin GI Bill so that all of the state citizens, and not just our UW students, are helping to support veterans in their education. John will be a very powerful ally in those meetings, and I thank him in advance for his willingness to do this. Now it's my pleasure to present to the Board of Regents the Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, John Skokos. Thank you, President Riley. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I, first, I want to extend my continuing thanks to the System President, Kevin Riley, for his exceptional efforts in working together with the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs on issues of importance to education of nearly half a million veterans. I'd also like to thank President Walsh and Ambassador Loftus for their service in the Armed Forces, and Mr. Bradley for not only his family service, for what he's done to assist the state veterans programs. And it's been a great pleasure working with Doug Bradley, Chris Andrews, David Miller, Ann Builder, all working on federal and legislative issues. As Veterans Day approaches, we're again pleased by the work of the legislature and Governor Doyle for enacting the new Wisconsin GI Bill for our state's veterans. More than 60 years ago, Congress enacted the initial form of the federal GI Bill, and despite concerns, at the time, the GI Bill helped change the face of America, allowing motivated World War II and later veterans to pursue a complete higher education. However, inflation, time, and priorities have allowed the GI Bill benefit to deteriorate over time. Today, its benefits are often not enough to pay for a full education, let alone additional costs of paying for room and board. And in today's educational environment, a typical 15-credit full-time course load can often translate into a 60-hour or more educational work week for students, making full-time employment impossible, even limited-time part-time employment to cover living costs extremely difficult without sacrificing educational achievement. Additionally, additionally the federal GI Bill has significant limitations. While there is no income limitation, it's use is limited to the first 10 years following discharge from active duty military service. Veterans with less than three years of active service receive a lesser benefit, and many of the tens of thousands of reserve and National Guard veterans called the tours of active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and beyond receive less than minimal amount of assistance toward their education, less than enough to cover the cost of tuition at the UW institution. The new Wisconsin GI Bill which I can stop and say one thing about our governor. Our governor enacted this legislation. He's been probably one of the most ardent supporters of doing what's right for our veterans in our state. And I commend him today. I commend him tomorrow for his service on Veterans Day. Wisconsin is probably one of the most progressive states in the nation for taking care of their veterans. And no one knows that better than Speaker Loftus because Speaker Loftus at the time helped initiate some of the most important programs that we've been building on for the last 15 years. So I commend him today to 
especially as a veteran, for tomorrow. And the requirement that a veteran was a state resident at the time of initiation of this legislation is to recur encourage Wisconsin veterans to return back to their home state for military service. Given our experience with welcome home packets, reaching out to veterans across the nation, a large percentage do not. And we know that people who try Wisconsin like it, suggesting that many of the newly educated veterans who study here may remain and stay here. And the open-ended nature of the lifetime benefit may be a good encouragement for our veterans to stay on permanently, whether or not they ever use it again. Wisconsin veterans of any year are currently attending the UW or Wisconsin Technical College and System Institution with a 50% waiver. And this year, the legislature increased that benefit to a full 100% remission, effective fall of 2007. Through the combined efforts of the University of Wisconsin system under the leadership of President Riley and the Wisconsin Technical College and our department, we were successful in convincing the bill's author to amend the bill to allow it to be a one-year time delay before the implementation order for the UW and WTC systems to better understand the demand from the current Wisconsin GI Bill to seek additional funding appropriately budget. We look forward to working with President Riley on seeking the funding with both sides of the party. Our agency is not Democrat nor Republican, but it's doing what's right for its citizen veterans that have served their country and now are coming home to do their, to do their best in society. We have young veterans at war now in two theaters of operation. They are our future. We have over 9,000 new reserve and guardsmen who are veterans in our state. And the biggest thing that we've heard loud and clear for those returning veterans are two things. We want education and we want health care. And education, we have veterans that are in their mid-50s who came back home after serving in Iraq that want to change their career course. And an important side note that I, I know I talked to President Riley about last year was the 30th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, something that tore our country apart. What more than to compliment that era of veterans, allowing them to go back to school now when so many of them, if we've seen in our Milwaukee urban area, have been put out of school or put out of work due to factory jobs leaving from different states. This is a tremendous benefit, not only to our students, but all our veterans of here. And as Governor Doyle has said, we want to grow Wisconsin. We can grow it by allowing our veterans to come back into the workforce. And I go back to what President Riley said. Our veterans in 1944 and 1946 came back to the state, helped build the economy, helped build the state. Our future leaders were veterans. I hope this new generation, the 21st century veterans, who are seeing more and more 40% of those young men and women coming back who served combat in Iraq have post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of the new challenges we have as a community, as a state, and that's why our state, and I thank our governor, because in our budget, we have probably one of the most progressive budgets that we're reaching out for additional monies to help the federal VA with post-traumatic stress in the rural areas of our counties, but and help our, our veterans in the urban area. So our challenges are many. One, taking care of our veterans, but with partnership, working with President Ryle and the university system and our technical schools, we can reach that goal. And I thank you for your assistance, and I thank you for taking the time today. I know from my experience of uh, having a board over me, too, there's a lot of things that go on, and you've got a lot of things <laughs> going on. But I, I thank our two veterans, and I can't say enough about Ambassador Loftus, because I, uh, I was a young captain when I met him, and we were talking, we both went to the same barber. And uh, <laughs> mine, mine put a little well from him, but uh, I haven't forgotten the, uh, the, the, great, the great things that he did to uh, in the legislature to make this a better state. So I thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes of your time. Tomorrow is Veterans Day at the Capitol. Governor Doyle will be there. A lot of our state officials, please attend. We've seen a tremendous change in uh, family members and young people and young families coming out to the Capitol. And then I invite all the regents to join us in our Veterans Day Parade. It's the second year of having a Veterans Day Parade. Please join us along with our congressional delegation. And hopefully we can pull the governor into that uh, too. And uh, we'll have a good day honoring our legacy of our veterans in Wisconsin. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, John, uh, for your remarks and for being here. And what we all recognize is the very busiest time of the year for you and, and your colleagues. Uh, our campuses have, have begun to open their arms to our newest veterans now, and we're fortunate to have one of them here with us today to express her thanks and appreciation for Wisconsin's having one of the very best sets of veterans educational benefits in the country, and for us to express our thanks for her service. Her name is Liz O'Hara. She's a member of the Wisconsin Air National Guard, and she's also a junior studying communication arts here at UW-Madison. Our friends on the Madison campus might recognize Liz by her byline. The Badger Herald has been running excerpts of her Iraq journal every Monday where she does tell it like it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Liz O'Hara. Sergeant. My name is Liz O'Haran. Um, as President Riley said, I am a junior studying communication arts here at the UW-Madison. Um, I also work for Vets for Vets, which is a student organization that is uh, primarily geared towards providing veterans information about their educational benefits, um, and I am also a veteran. I just want to give you a little bit of background information about myself. Um, I enlisted when I was 17. I was a senior in high school. Um, two days before September 11th, I completed most of the paperwork to get my, enlist my enlistment rolling. Um, two days after September 11th, I actually was sworn in. Um, so that was a bit of a rough week for me and my parents, um, but ultimately I decided to go through with it. And uh, it wasn't until the fall of 2004 that I was actually called up for the first time. Um, I have been deployed twice for a total of seven months to the Middle East. Um, I made the transition from getting, um, from having a military deployment and plunging headfirst back into school, as well as um, this summer, I was called up to Iraq for a couple of months, and I actually was pulled out of school early, and I missed um, all my finals. But I know the university catches a little bit of flack for being um, perhaps a hotbed of anti-war sentiment, but I can definitely attest personally to the true support that the university um, showed me when I was called up. All my professors were amazing. They let me take all of my finals early. They were fair and flexible, and um, that truly took a lot of the stress off the deployment process. Um, but going from the transition from military to the educational world is not an easy transition to make. Um, I truly believe that if it wasn't for the amazing benefits that Wisconsin and the UW system provides for its, for its student veterans, that maybe not as many veterans would be willing to make that tough transition. Um, it might just be easier not to try to go back to school. Um, I cannot think of a better way to say thank you to our veterans than by offering them a free education. Benefits like the Wisconsin GI Bill, they encourage people that um, enlisted from Wisconsin and are currently residents of Wisconsin to go to school here in Wisconsin. Um, a lot of times people who um, enlist in the active duty armed services, the Air Force, the Army, they, they go away from Wisconsin for four years or eight years or 12 years, and they forget their roots. They don't remember that Wisconsin's home. But the Wisconsin GI Bill and other educational benefits gives them a reason to come back to Wisconsin and get an education. And I truly believe that those experiences that they've, that they've learned throughout the world, um, when they come back here, it, it enriches our community and that everyone benefits from it. And that's, that's a measure that can't be um, weighed in terms of money or dollars. Uh, a lot of National Guard benefits enlist to serve the military right here from Wisconsin. And I can't think of a better way to say thank you to them when they go overseas than to give them a reason to come back home and go to school here in Wisconsin, which is where they want to be. They want to be at home. And uh, Wisconsin is truly one of the leaders in the country as far as educational benefits are concerned. And um, me personally, I have people like yourself to thank for that, as well as um, other good citizens of Wisconsin. So thank you, and uh, happy Veterans Day. Thank Thank you, Liz. We're uh, all very proud of you and all our other student veterans in the UW system. Thanks for being with us. Let me, uh, let me close this section of, of the remarks with a reminder that uh, our colleagues at Wisconsin Public Television will air the premiere of Wisconsin Korean War Stories this Monday, November 13th, in back-to-back hour-long programs at 8 and 9 p.m. Uh, these programs tell the stories of 37 Wisconsin veterans who fought in that often forgotten war. 
I'll uh, personally salute most of those Korean veterans at a reception at Brittingham House early next year. Uh, finally, I'd like to ask all of our servicemen and women here today to stand and receive our heartfelt thanks, all of our veterans. Please stand. A few words now about uh, our continuing advocacy for our growth agenda for Wisconsin. We're still on a full court press. Uh, we took a trip off to River Falls on October 25th and 26th and joined uh, Chancellor Don Betts and some of his colleagues on a, a round of uh, very, very busy visits. They ran me ragged in that part of the state. I want to tell you, we, uh, John and I met with several citizens groups in the St. Croix Valley, uh, started out with a very nice uh, Sec, uh, session in the city of St. Croix Falls and Polk County where the mayor of St. Croix Falls, uh, Brad Foss, greeted us and introduced us and uh, had a group of very interested, uh, lively students there to talk about the university. We spoke uh, with the growth agenda with a hundred people at a, a Chamber of Commerce uh, breakfast, breakfast in River Falls. We had uh, an opportunity in Hudson to talk to 200 members of, a, of two combined Rotary Clubs there for lunch and the host of that session was the publisher of four of the daily newspapers in the St. Croix area. We also uh, went over across the border, across the river to St. Paul and met with the editorial page editor of the St. Paul Pioneer Press. We got some nice uh, coverage when I was up there and I think uh, Don, we're still hoping to get an editorial uh, after the election now from uh, that newspaper. Uh, he was very, very interested in the, in the growth agenda. Uh, the UW River Falls Faculty Senate has strongly endorsed uh, the growth agenda for Wisconsin and I think maybe their chair, Dr. Wes Craven, is here. I know he was here yesterday. Wes, are you? Still in the back and I, I thank him and his colleagues uh, for that. You had copies of that resolution in your packets, I believe, yesterday. Uh, we also um, had the three branches of shared governance of UW Superior uh, send a letter of support for the growth agenda for Wisconsin to the governor. It was signed by the student senate president, the chair of the academic staff senate, the chair of the faculty senate. I don't know if Donna or Martha are either of you here today. I guess no. Or is Stefan? Okay, the, the, the student leader. Stefan, stand up. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. It was a very good piece. Um, the, the letter directly asked the governor and the state to support the region's, uh, region's budget. Um, I also had a, an opportunity to meet with the uh, alumni council from uh, around the system. This is the group of alumni association directors from our institutions to talk about uh, uh, using our alumni to more effectively advocate for the university and in particular for the growth agenda for Wisconsin and they're all working on uh, our alumni for Wisconsin effort which is uh, a new effort across the system to do do just that. So uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the regents uh, who have been involved in speaking on behalf of the growth agenda. I know a number of you have. Let's, let's keep that up. Uh, on December 11th, I'll be heading over to UW Parkside for, uh, to speak to their all group, ALL, which stands for Adventures uh, in Lifelong Learning, which is a group of senior citizens, very, very active, connected uh, sort of loosely to the UW Parkside campus. Chancellor Keating recently spoke to them. Uh, I spoke to them a couple years ago about Irish literature, so they'll really be confused when I come back over and speak about the budget. Uh, but uh, we have a little panel that uh, we'll, we have put together with uh, former regent Al B. Simone and current regent Chris Semenes, and I'll be the rose between two thorns on that panel. And we will talk about the growth agenda for Wisconsin and uh, get those senior citizens activated, I hope, on behalf of the university. Uh, also, while I was up in River Falls with Chancellor Betts, I learned that UW River Falls and the Chippewa Valley Technical College have received a five-year, $2.5 million grant from the Department of Education to expand online learning. It's called Stronger Together, an Educational Partnership for the Changing Economy. The goal is to build a larger and more educated workforce in that eight county region of Wisconsin and Minnesota combined. So um, the highly competitive grant that they received will help the campuses work together to educate students through web-based distance and other alternative uh, learning, uh, alternative delivery methods. It's the third grant of this kind awarded to River Falls, UW River Falls in the past 15 years. 
As Chancellor Betts has said, the program is a, quote, true collaborative effort that will meet the interests of citizens in West Central Wisconsin. Combined, the campuses uh, involved serve about 15,000 students, so congratulations on that. Uh, in the interest of, uh, of leaving adequate time for the very important Regents Teaching Excellence Awards that, that we're always very excited to have at this meeting, I won't go on with uh, a lot of other good news items. Uh, I, I get wonderful stories every month. I wish I could take the time to tell them all to you every month. Uh, you can read more of them than I'll have time to go into today from our, our institutions. If you go to www.wisconsin.edu, that's the university's web uh, page, website, and click on news. Uh, we've got now a regular feeding onto that uh, site of, of the good news stories that come out of our campuses, and they're really heartening to, to see. Uh, a sad note uh, for a moment, I, I wanted us all to to reflect a bit on the life and legacy of, of a colleague, former UW Scout Provost uh, Bob Sedlak, who was taken from us Tuesday after a very quick, uh, tough battle with cancer. Bob served his campus for 23 years, both in the classroom and in administration. He loved UW Scout, and he loved higher education. Among Bob's many accomplishments is the uh, critical role he played in establishing the School of Education at Scout, which remains very successful because of his vision and his leadership. Bob was also extremely active in the community and had a special love for the Boy Scouts. He was a devoted Blue Devils fan as well. He loved working in his flower gardens, and he often would bring uh, beautiful flower bouquets to his office on campus, which delighted his colleagues. And uh, during his life, he, he planted uh, more than just flowers. He planted good ideas and bright young minds, and we will never forget all that he did to make UW Stout, the Menominee community in Wisconsin, a better place. He, he will truly be missed. Another wonderful public servant whom we'll dearly miss is uh, Doris Hansen, who died on Wednesday. She was the first woman ever to serve as the Secretary of the Department of Administration, and she understood that government works best when it works efficiently. Doris was later elected to the State Assembly, where she served her Monona constituents very well. Still later in her, uh, her career, she became the Executive Director of TEACH, the TEACH office, which stood for Technology for Educational Achievement. The mission of that office, as some of you know, was to see that our schools all across Wisconsin got wired to accommodate the new educational technologies. Wisconsin is a better place because of Doris Hansen, and we will miss her work ethic, her example, and her contributions. Doris, I think, would be happy, uh, I know she would be happy, if I shared a brief observation about this week's elections. Uh, as a true believer in the vitality of democracy, I'm extremely impressed by the large voter turnout this time around, especially by our UW-Wisconsin students, regardless of whom they voted for. Our young people did vote, and that's an important and impressive fact. And they understand, too, that their votes do make a difference. They certainly did in this recent election. Early national reports indicate that turnout among 18 to 29-year-olds increased by more than 2 million voters in this midterm election compared to 2002. Youth-dense precincts that were targeted by get-out-the-vote campaigns showed even larger increases. And Wisconsin led the way, I'm proud to say. At UW-Madison, heavily student-concentrated wards indicated a 66% increase in voter turnout over the last election. And UW campuses at La Crosse, at Stevens Point, at Milwaukee, at Oshkosh, and at Eau Claire had similar very large increases. The student newspaper at UW Eau Claire, The Spectator, reported just yesterday that while get out the vote efforts there were, quote, nonpartisan, uh, commitments from candidates to, quote, fight for tuition limits with guarantees of additional state funding, unquote, were proof of strong student influence. In your packets, you'll see information from Associate Vice President Margaret Lewis, which points out that six legislative districts changed hands where there is a UW campus, and that three university instructors are among the 20 new state legislators elected on Tuesday. I intend to engage several of our political scientists in a further analysis of the impact of young voters on this week's elections in Wisconsin. We need to know more about how large voter turnout by our UW students and UW faculty and staff, I believe, helped to elect and to defeat candidates this time around. And we want our elected officials, 
and candidates in the future to understand that too. I'm proud of our students for exercising their democratic rights, and we will work with them to have even larger, even larger numbers do so in the future. As Thomas Jefferson once said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Our students were vigilant this week, and we salute them for it. Now, since Thanksgiving will come uh, before we meet again, Mr. President, I thought I'd conclude my remarks with what I think is a very nice little Thanksgiving poem. Um, it's by Anne Sexton, who is a uh, 20th century American poet who hailed from the Wisconsin state from western, western Massachusetts. It's called Welcome Morning. There is joy in all, in the hair I brush each morning, in the cannon towel newly washed that I rub my body with each morning, in the chapel of eggs I cook each morning, in the outcry from the kettle that heats my coffee each morning, in the spoon and the chair that cry, hello there, Anne, each morning, in the godhead of the table that I set my silver plate cup upon each morning. All this is God right here in my pea green house each morning. And I mean, though, I often forget to give thanks, to faint down by the kitchen table in a prayer of rejoicing as the holy birds at the kitchen window peck into their marriage of seeds. So while I think of it, let me paint a thank you on my palm for this God, this laughter of the morning, lest it go unspoken. The joy that isn't shared, I've heard, dies young. So may all your Thanksgivings 2006 be joyfully shared. Mr. President, that concludes my report. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a good reason not to let two Irishmen have the podium. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine what's going to happen in, Mar in March. Um, <laughs> Two other items. Uh, uh, as of Wednesday, the state of Wisconsin is no longer the second lowest tuition for in-state students. We are the lowest in the Big Ten. Uh, the Board of Regents for the University of Iowa raised their tuition 6.1% to pass us. And um, we'll see what we can do to keep that. Uh, I, it's also instructive that you know, we've had a lot of criticism about out-of-state students. At the University of Iowa, 43% of their students are from out-of-state, and 25% are from the Chicago area. And so it's another example of out-of-state students providing funds for in-state students. But in our system, uh, we're less than 10% total and 25% at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it's a message we got to keep telling because people get a little confused about that. The second item is that the disciplinary committee, ably chaired by Michael Spector, is now in its second full year of working <laughs> <laughs> on changes to the code. And if you'll re re remember, the reason we started this process is that the system wasn't moving quick enough on charged felons. And we are proving why it is so hard to change things. But I assure you, and Michael Spector assures you, that when we're done, it will work, and it will work quickly. You will receive a report at the December meeting, and we will have something for you to vote on. In the meantime, on the 16th day of November, we will be meeting with more faculty representatives to discuss the balancing of interests. And uh, we will have a result. Uh, also serving on that is Regent Smith and Re Regent Rosenzweig. And, uh, Pat Brady and her staff have done a wonderful job of putting together the pieces of this, this kind of mosaic. But we will have something, and I think it will be something that everyone will be happy with. Now, each fall, the Board of Regents recognizes the recipients of the Regents Teaching Excellence Awards. This, is, uh, this year will mark the 14th year of these presentations. They were established in 1992 as a way of recognizing and rewarding, rewarding our finest individual teachers and academic departments in the UW system. This remains the cornerstone of our university system. And when we talk about access being important, likewise, quality is important. And no one would want access if we didn't have this wonderful quality and today we're going to honor some of those people. Each fall we confer three awards, two individual awards and one department award. 
The individual awards recognize outstanding career achievements by our finest individual teachers, and the department award honors collaborative teaching achievement. The award program is administered by the <coughs> University of Wisconsin System Office of Professional and Instructional Development. Special Regents Committee is established, and I want to thank each of those who are involved. The uh, awards will be presented today uh, jointly by Regent Davis, Chair of the Selection Committee, and her fellow committee members, Regents Pruitt, Salas, and Seminus. Regent Davis. Thank you, President Walsh. I am truly pleased to once again be a part of today's presentation of the Regents Teaching Excellence Awards for 2006 and would like to welcome this year's recipients, their friends, family, and supporters. I'm sure we won't let the weather uh, dampen our celebration. These awards represent an award opportunity for the board to recognize and honor some of the University of Wisconsin System's most outstanding teachers, departments, and programs. I think all of us in this room understand what a very valuable resource we have in our faculty and our academic staff who enthusiastically teach day in and day out with dedication, creativity, and passion, and to whom we entrust the education and enlightenment of our citizens of the future. But as we have noticed of late, that acknowledgement does not always find voice outside the halls of academia. As regents, we must take advantage of every opportunity to publicly honor the dedication that goes with the acts of teaching and learning. The awards we make today represent one way of expressing our appreciation. Truly these awards are meaningful as evidenced by the fact that, despite having broken both of her ankles, <laughs> Dr. Katherine Olson joins us today to accept her award. Regents Pruitt, Salas, and Simonis join me again as part of this year's selection team, and I thank them for their thoughtful presentation. I also want to publicly thank the team that works with us day in and day out um, from Chorus Team, and particularly the work of Rebecca Karoff for the outstanding work they do in shepherding us on this very, very um, deeply heartfelt, fun project and process that we use. <coughs> As always, the pool of nominees was truly exceptional. Selecting the winners was extremely challenging, but also rewarding. The members of the UW community we honor today are shining examples of the ability that excellent teachers have to change students' lives. While they all go about this ta in, uh, task in unique ways, they share several striking characteristics, a distinct philosophy of teaching and learning, a willingness to adapt and innovate in order to meet the needs of the students, a passion for their discipline, and a commitment to the constant self-examination and improvement. They all are also highly respected by their colleagues. This year, as in prior years, uh, my colleagues on the committee will briefly introduce one of the honorees who will then briefly address the board. You will find profiles of each of these award honorees in your folders. And then um, they've also been distributed throughout the, uh, the room to chancellors, provosts, and others who we are also pleased to welcome today. We encourage you to read them for the brief remarks we make today do not do justice to the wealth of talent, dedication, and passion of the teachers joining us at the podium today. Regent Salas will present the very first award. Thank you very much, Regent Davis. Uh, before I proceed with the Regent's uh, Teaching Excellence Award, I wanted to take a moment to recognize Senior Vice President uh, Cora Merritt's contribution uh, in the recognition of our departments, our faculty, and academic staff. I think there will be an opportunity later on to recognize uh, uh, her contribution uh, to the system, but uh, as long as I've been serving as a region for the four years, I've had the pleasure to work with Cora and Rebecca in this capacity, and I just want to take a second to recognize you, Cora. Thank you. I am honored to... I 
I am, I am honored today to introduce uh, our first 2006 Regents Teaching Excellence Award winner, Dr. John Coulter. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I saw you over here earlier. I wanted to make sure that uh, you were nearby. Uh, professor of Mathematics at the University of Wisconsin at, uh, at Oshkosh. Once again, the nominees were extraordinarily gifted and dedicated group of professors who have long been contributing to their departments, to their divisions, and especially to their students in the classroom. All of them have been recognized by their campuses for their outstanding nature of their commitment to their students as well as to their community. Professor Coker is a recipient of the John McNaughton Rosebush Professor for Excellence in Teaching, Research, and Service as well as a Distinguished Teaching Award, two of the highest awards bestowed uh, upon the faculty at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. Professor Coker's further recognition, uh, in my estimation, is timely, uh, because it was the topic of one of our most recent regions uh, uh, meeting on the remediation of English and mathematics skills of a select number of our campuses in our UW system. We happily learned that students who take uh, uh, these remediation courses not only enhance uh, their communication and computational skills, but they enhance their retention and graduation rates. I believe Professor Coker is profoundly aware of the needs of the students, not only those in the classroom today, but those on their way. His achievements are not simply limited to his outstanding teaching, but extend beyond the walls of the university. The training of the teachers include enhancing the skills of those already in the classroom. He has authored and received upwards of $350,000 in grants to offer high quality mathematical instruction to middle and high school teachers. A significant portion of his grant money was used to reach out to the Native American communities of the Menominee Indian School District and the Menominee Tribal Schools where he helped to create an atmosphere of, quote, mathematical reasoning and problem solving, unquote, in the classroom. Notice, notice that I said middle school teachers, not just, uh, not just uh, uh, high school. And I'm reminded, I'm reminded of this uh, when uh, several weeks ago, President Riley approached, uh, I took my uh, son, Theo, a 10-year-old, uh, to the football game, and uh, 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 President Riley very generously came over and uh, greeted him, asked him what uh, grade he was in. He said that he was uh, in fifth grade, and asked him he, uh, how he was doing. Theo, my 10-year-old son, proceeded to tell him that he was having a great time because for the first time, he had an English teacher, he had a social studies teacher, and a math teacher. And he recalled that uh, in fourth grade, he uh, had had some difficulty learning cursive and uh, 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 doing uh, uh, double and triple digit division. Can you imagine anything more painful? And, uh, <laughs> Professor uh, 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 Riley told him, "Well, Theo, it's all downhill now. You're going to have a <laughs> you're going to have a great time in uh, in middle school." And I think uh, Professor uh, 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 Coker is very aware of uh, of this uh, uh, type of problems that we have and the need to instruct and to help those uh, 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 teachers who are in the, in, the, in the classrooms, not only in our high schools, but also in our, uh, 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 our middle school. I'm reminded uh, uh, also that, uh, that um, as I read through uh, Professor Coker's dossier, I was struck by how deeply he has reflected on his own teaching and how he has passed on that imperative for reflection. Uh, he may be teaching his students math, but he's also teaching them the ability to think through the problems deeply in every sphere of their lives within and beyond the classroom. 
I thought this was missing in my uh, son's instruction in fourth grade, and I think it is absent for many students of math in the middle and high schools, and that's why we have the problems that we have and that we need to address them when they come to our uh, campuses. We need to contemplate thus uh, on Professor Coker's philosophy and direct our students to focus uh, uh, on problem-solving processes than rather just simply uh, trying to get the answer, as my son Tail had been doing in fourth uh, grade. In his own words, uh, Professor Coker uh, says he wants his students to see, quote, uh, that problem-solving is provoked by contradiction, tension, and surprise and is supported by an atmosphere of questions encouraging and challenging. One of his students writes, I always look forward to each of John's classes because I knew how I would be challenged, but I also knew that the students would play a significant role in the course. In short, Dr. Coker embodies the Wisconsin idea regularly and successfully engaging citizens both in and out of the classroom. UW Oshkosh Provost uh, 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 writes, he is unequivocally one of the best teachers, scholars, and overall campus citizens that the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh has produced in my 19 years uh, here. While the task of choosing a recipient among so many talented nominees might seem daunting, we were not struck uh, on this problem for very long after examining John Coker's uh, dossier. Other fellow members of the board, our first 2006 Regents Teaching Excellence Award winner, Professor John Coker. I guess I, I want to start by, by thanking the Board of Regents, and um, I guess I need to be honest as well to say I feel quite humbled at this time by your remarks. Um, I also feel rather fortunate and, and rather lucky. As a mathematician, I, I suppose I, I should know what luck is, but I don't. <laughs> Never been able to figure that out. Um, it was something that my mother always told me she didn't have. Um, but um, I feel lucky and fortunate because I know um, firsthand um, from all the excellent faculty and teachers that I get to work with every day. And so just the way luck would have it, um, I'm fortunate to be honored while I know there's, there's so many others that, um, that could be here as well. Um, as part of the nomination process, I needed to reflect on my own career and document um, you know, what has happened to me as a teacher over the years. And I left one thing out that I thought I would share with you today. And um, it was about 12 or 13 years ago when I would meet somebody uh, on an airplane or someone I didn't know and some conversation would be uh, started, a normal question would ask is, well, what do you do for a living? And I got to a point that I didn't want to tell anybody that I was a math teacher. Um, and the reason I didn't want to tell anybody that is because you can probably guess what their response was when you say that you're a math teacher. Usually when something like, oh, God, I hate math. <laughs> <laughs> I've always had math. Um, my mother couldn't do math. My father couldn't do math. Uh, we had that one uncle <laughs> on my dad's side who, was, who did math, but th we were never sure about him. And, um, so I just got tired of hearing that. And so just on a spur of the moment, someone on an airplane once asked me what I did for a living. And I said I was a roofer. <laughs> and I can, so I started using that answer quite a bit. And I can tell you, of all the times I use that answer, not one person has ever said to me, oh, God, I hate roofing. <laughs> my mother couldn't roof a house. My father couldn't roof a house. 
there was a, there was an uncle. <laughs> well, he was a roofer, but um, but anyway, um, never happened. Um, I won't bore you with the story when I when the person next to me was actually a roofer. But <laughs> I don't do that anymore because I figured there was something wrong with that because when people tell me that they hate math I tell them that they don't they just don't know that they like it <laughs> and I talk about a lot of that in my classes now I talk about from my students that I want them to learn math but I also want them to learn I've come to realize that students don't learn by watching me do mathematics they learn by being actively engaged in doing and then thinking and reflecting about what they have done. In my classes and in liberal arts education in general, we need to allow students the opportunity to be stuck, to understand that the state of being stuck is a natural, natural and honorable place to spend time during the problem solving process. And we need to examine and apply methods to become unstuck. My courses and many courses of the liberal arts education need to be spent on processes rather than skills or answers. Courses need to allow students to grow as thinkers so they can gain confidence as they realize they can improve with practice and reflection. They need to see that problem solving is provoked by contradiction, tension, and surprise and is supported by an atmosphere of questioning and challenging. This can be done by working on interesting and relevant topics. I've come to realize that teaching is a huge problem and it's probably the biggest problem that I will never solve. But along with my students, we can answer open questions in my field and about teaching and learning in general. We can realize that learning is about finding one's way through the unfamiliar and making sense out of it. Teaching is being the guide to those less experienced. I want to grow and learn as a teacher, and I continually look forward to challenges, obstacles, and successes. I may not solve the problem of teaching, but working on that problem will make me better. And so as I think about today and reflect about today, and if I can make one appeal, that we need to, to get that word out that teaching and learning is difficult, but in a supporting and challenging environment, our students can grow and become lifelong learners. Thank you. folks are tough acts to follow, I'll tell you. Um, I have had the good fortune to serve on uh, under Regent Davis's leadership on the Teaching Excellence Award Committee for four years now. Uh, it is, uh, as I think all of us have, have acknowledged already, an amazing experience. Uh, it is impossible. It is a far better experience, I might add, with all due respect, Regent Smith, than to serving on the Student Discipline Appeals. <laughs> <laughs> Never been one of my sort of highlights of my day. Um, also seems a lot better than serving on your committee, Regent Speck. <laughs> um, you know, it is absolutely impossible to not uh, emerge after spending a day looking at the applications and the recommendations with a sort of a new and profound appreciation about what it means to be a teacher and the extraordinary impact that the individual faculty members uh, of all the campuses across the state play, uh, the impact they, they have on the lives of students. Um, it is really something that, you know, you'll have to sort of pry it out of my, my hands, but I would encourage my colleagues to find an opportunity to serve on this committee in the future. We probably held on to the Rains a little too long, and I'm, I apologize already for letting the cat out of the bag. Where to begin? <laughs> um, where to begin in describing Kat, Dr. Catherine Olson, professor of communication at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, the second recipient we honor today? Do we begin with her previous honors, including being named a Wisconsin Teaching Scholar, a CIPD Scholar, Wisconsin Teaching Fellow, Andre T. Weaver Award for Wisconsin's Outstanding College Educator? or the Outstanding New Teacher Award from the Central States Communication Association. Well, others might begin there. I choose to start with the first three sentences of Katherine Olson's reflective statement. Quote, 
I was not born a teacher. I was born a learner. My stay-at-home mother, formerly an elementary school teacher, and my bossy older brother, who always aspired to be a teacher, needed learners. <laughs> um, well, although Katherine Olson was not born a teacher, she has turned into quite a remarkable one. Indeed, she has been characterized by her colleagues as the consummate teacher, dedicated, conscientious, and passionately interested in helping students learn. One of her students describes her Great American Speakers course as, quote, the most intellectually stimulating and invigorating class imaginable. That course had a profound effect on the student who goes on to say, I watched my normal way of thinking about the world and viewing it as black and white give way to a much more vibrant and conceptualized view of the world. I could step back and analyze artifacts from multiple perspectives. Catherine envisions her own teaching as a work in progress that is constantly subject to growth and change as she hones even the most tried and true instructional methods, developing innovative approaches and research, researching their effects. She describes her commitment to becoming an excellent teacher in the following way. To positively empower all my students for life outside the classroom, I needed to make the material more accessible to learners with various learning preferences and better connect that material to their concerns, experiences, and ability. This gradual revelation also prompted me to expand my research program to address issues of teaching, learning, curriculum, and empowerment. The fact that she has written over 30 articles having to do with teaching and rhetoric, in addition to giving and attending numerous teaching workshops, demonstrates her drive to become, to drive to be what she has become, a very gifted and talented teacher. Nor are her talents limited to classroom teaching. Professor Olson's spearheaded efforts to develop the rhetorical leadership program, which focuses on argumentation, critical thinking, and ethical considerations in training leaders and future leaders in government, industry, and nonprofit organizations. As her colleagues have noted, no other program of its kind exists in this country. A student having gone through the program writes that it was powerful and that it enables one to gain the skills that can change events. Influencing events herself, Professor Olson has devoted considerable effort to educational outreach activities working in the community to improve the understanding of political debates. Numerous appearances on WUWM radio and work with the Racine Group on presidential and other political debates demonstrates her interest in building a bridge between academic scholarship and community understanding. There can be no doubt in anyone's mind that from classroom to community, Professor Olson's work is truly exceptional. So Dr. Olson, we thank you for making the long journey, which I will note began at St. Olaf College, to UW-Eau Claire, and eventually to UW-Milwaukee. You are a role model for what it means to be a teacher and what this university system is really all about. It is my distinct pleasure to present and introduce broken ankles and all, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Catherine Olson. Thank you so much. First, I want to dispel the mystery. Um, I broke my ankles carrying my daughter down a set of stairs, and the bottom one was uneven. <laughs> so, so not beyond regular clumsiness. Um, she's fine, and of course, the silver lining is that I didn't have to try to decide which shoes to wear with my outfit today. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to so much thank the Board of Regents and the Selection Committee for this wonderful acknowledgment. I'm very honored and I'm somewhat surprised to be here today. As my introduction said, I was not a natural teacher and in fact I'd never necessarily set out to or planned to be a teacher. I just love learning and the surest way that I could get to read and discover and study every day seemed to be to get my PhD and become a university professor. As I went through school I was fortunate that my preferred learning style matched the preferred teaching methods of the day expert lectures, reading on your own, writing and studying. 
So when it came to teaching, I was baffled when the same process didn't work as well for all my students. Those for whom these approaches didn't resonate would write on their anonymous evaluations. She knows her stuff, and she's enthusiastic, but <laughs> I was motivated to try to give them a good experience, so I did what any rational person would do. I tried harder doing exactly the same things I was doing. <laughs> I would write better, wittier lectures, like the lectures that had worked so well for me and of the professors that I admired. And I would even have my husband sit and listen to me practice them, as he patiently did, and critique them so that they would be better. Gradually, I began to discover that there are many more ways of learning and that I needed to find a way ways to connect with different kinds of learners so they could enjoy the material the same way that I did. And what came easily to me was not the, the way to do that for others. Two features of the UW system have been critical to that discovery process and to my development as a teacher and the successful learning of my students. The first is sustained, supportive, active communities willing to devote time, energy, and resources to enhancing teaching and learning. I've been very fortunate to be a part of several of these within the UW system. The first is my communication department at UWM, which values teaching and pays attention to developing strong teachers in addition to simultaneously being a dynamite research program. We had regular peer reviews even before I got there, way before it was fashionable or required, and gave each other advice on how to make things better. We have an unusually large number of both junior and senior faculty who are involved in the scholarship of teaching and learning, or who work with educational innovations and distance learning, and who engage in research and discussion of teaching and learning issues, and that's just not the norm at research universities. This leads us to have a department with an unusually large number of outstanding teachers, so I was very flattered that the department endorsed me because I think so highly of their teaching already. And it gives us a culture of excellence in teaching, not only research. Another such community that's helped is UWM Center for the Instructional and Professional Development, led by Tony Sacconi and the, Learn the Learning Technology Center, led by Alan Acock, which offer many effective one-time training programs. More than that, I have benefited, and my students have benefited twice, from the Center for Instructional and Professional Development, which the university system supports in conjunction with the campus, um, their fellows program. This creates a sustained dialogue among a small interdisciplinary group of serious teachers and the luxury to devote some time to systematic investigations of issues of teaching and learning. The newly formed UW System Leadership Site, based at UWM and led by my communication colleague, Renee Myers, extends such productive discussions and builds research connections across campuses in the UW system. Especially early on, nothing was better for me than the UW system's faculty college for a three-day dose of enthusiasm, colleague contacts, and ideas that you could use tomorrow in your classroom. And faculty college, of course, is only one example of the wonderful work that the UW system's Office of Professional and Instructional Development, led by Lisa Kornetsky and her wonderful staff, provide. Um, I've been fortunate to also participate when I was a young scholar in the Teaching Fellows Program and when I was a slightly older scholar in the Teaching Scholars Program, which is essentially summer camp for teachers. We get together for an intensive summer collaboration followed up by a year of research projects and, of course, a lifetime of connections with other <laughs> UW teachers across the system. <laughs> Such communities require conscious, systematic support and attention to be sustained and expanded to include more Wisconsin teachers and they make the ultimate difference in fostering more successful learning experiences for our UW students. If you touch one teacher through these programs, you touch hundreds, even thousands sometimes, of students. So I urge you to continue to do anything you can to support these teaching and learning centered communities. The second critical feature of the UW system that has been important to me in developing as a teacher is the shared vision that keeps the students and our public constituents at the center. Over the past five years, my rhetoric colleagues at UWM, Bill Keith, John Jordan, and I, have built a rhetorical leadership graduate certificate program. And our goal here is to prepare effective citizen leaders, including those who are returning from the community who don't need a <coughs> master's degree in communication, but who need the kind of skills that will help them lead unstructured groups of people in part-time leadership roles, as almost all of us have to do every day in the various facets of our lives. 
Rhetoric is the study of effective symbol use to generate and use power in situations that require shared solutions or joint actions. It's a discipline that was born of practical need and has been theoretically refined over the last 2,000 years. So to me, it's always seemed the ultimate in theoretically grounded practice and leadership, and especially appropriate for today's information-rich, complex, authority, loose, or uh, without a lot of authority structures kind of society. But of course, we have a public relations problem, and that is that we put rhetoric in our title, <laughs> 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 uh, which we thought was important because it's important. But of course, the popular view of rhetoric is something that is negative, empty, and other than action, rather than being the critical glue that holds together joint action and makes for shared solutions. Yet with the active support of UWM's College of Letters and Science Dean Richard Meadows and Associate Dean Chuck Schuster, the program has become a reality and is serving constituencies beyond letters and science, including a couple weeks ago the Wisconsin Federation of Museum Directors, Urban Studies, Applied Gerontology, and Education. So we've been able to build not only the program, but the constituency that has to be built along at the same time. We have to show people that they need this program as well as, as delivering it to them. Commitment to the overarching goal of creating programs that serve students and the community's ongoing needs, even if they don't know it yet, makes possible such curricular innovation. So I would like to thank you for this lovely honor. I'd like to thank my husband, Brian, and my daughter, Kayla, and my very loving and supportive family. And also, of course, most of all, I'd like to thank God who gives joy in our hearts and is a very present help in times of trouble. Thank you. And finally, um, it is my distinct honor to bestow the 2006 Regents Teaching Excellence Award for a department or program to the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire's Department of History, represented here today by the chair of that department, Professor Catherine Lang. But before we get started, I wanted to stay, say a few words. Being a part of the generation in college when, 2000, when on September 11, 2001, happened, I became on a search for answers. And to find out, and to do that, I majored in history. And I found out, <coughs> excuse me, and I found out also during this time that since 2001, <coughs> the number of history majors have increased at our universities. Why? Because students say the same thing that I said. We are leaders who want to search for the answers to tomorrow's problems and to today's problems. Us history majors are an eccentric group of people. <laughs> but we want to find the answers to the problems of today and tomorrow. And that is important because we look to the past to see that. Because let's take a moment here. Let's close our eyes and picture. If we didn't have a history department like the one at UW-Eau Claire, or the one that granted my undergraduate degree from UW Parkside. We would have, and we would forget history, we would have the society where we forgot about the struggles of our founding fathers to create this great democracy that we live in. We'd forget about the struggles of our friends like Jesus Salas, who marched with migrant workers for equal rights. We'll forget about the struggles of our civil rights leaders in the South to bring change and equality. We'd forget about the women who stood proud to get equal pay and are still fighting for that today. Or let's look to Wisconsin. We would forget about how this board took a stance for academic freedom in the turning point of our last century, and today we still stand for that struggle. But we also stand to spread the Wisconsin idea of Bob LaFollette, and today we stand to spread President Riley's growth agenda for our state. History is a correlation of yesterday and to the problems and to the hope of tomorrow. 
It's my honor to, be, to have been able to major in history, but it's also my honor to recognize a program that I have had many friends go through and that I've heard firsthand the importance and how it has changed their life. We will not forget history because we do have programs like the Department of History at UW Eau Claire. And that's why I want to list the ways why it is excellent and why we will remember today when the history books turn back, not just of everything that's changing in our world today, but because of departments like this that will allow students to study the decisions that you and me are making today and tomorrow. First of all, the, De the Eau Claire Department of History serves 117 history majors in the Colleges of Arts and Sciences, 97 majors in the College of Education and Human Sciences, 65 history minors, and provides 400 student credit hours each semester through general education courses. The maximum of 28 students are currently enrolled in the master's program. In spite of the great numbers of students served, the deep dedication of the faculty has enabled the department to tailor the curriculum and, pro and projects to meet the needs of individual students. The student letters extol departments, departmental faculty as advisors and mentors who guide and support students through individualized research projects and career opportunities. In recent years, building a diverse faculty has been paramount importance to the department, which 14 tenured and tenured track faculty, six of whom are women, including one African American, one Latino, one Native American, and one Asian. The department curriculum further represents the diverse <coughs> diversity covering many regions of the world and a variety of aspects of the human experience. Individual faculty members have published important works on Native American peoples and in the areas of immigration, public history, rural history, and women's history. The department has an outstanding record of attracting external grant funding to launch innovative programs to improve history education at the elementary and secondary levels. During the last five years, the department has scored nearly $4 million in grants from the U.S. Department of Education, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Wisconsin Humanities Council, and the American Council of Learned Societies. These grants have funded two graduate programs for teachers of American history and has served over 296 teachers involved with close collaboration with local museums and cooperative educational service agencies throughout the state. The programs emphasize connections between local and national history. Through grant money, the department has also successfully hired a public historian who has spearheaded the creation of a curriculum in public history. These graduate and undergraduate courses have attracted a growing number of students who work on public history projects that directly benefit the community and region. Students have partnered with the Chippewa Valley Museum, the Minnesota Historical Society, Wisconsin State Historical Society, and the State Office of Historic Preservation on a number of projects and exhibits. Students rave about the dedication, collaboration, teaching excellence, and the personal mentoring of the faculty. In the words of one student, the entire department becomes mobilized to collectively support the educational dreams of each student. And in the end, the department is creating historians who are passionate about their discipline and who are and who communicate that passion well, and who engage in research projects that benefit the region and build on our understandings of our communities and surroundings. Whether investigating the historical aspects of the ban on the use of death penalty in Wisconsin and presenting their findings to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, or whether creating historical exhibits for the Chippewa Falls Museum of Industry and Technology through modeled collaboration the UW Eau Claire History Department students are meeting the challenges posed by the 21st century and will be the leaders who will help us solve tomorrow's problems. Given this truly exceptional nature of this department, it is my great honor to present this award to the UW Eau Claire Department of History. And Professor Catherine Lang, please come forward.
Well, I can see that the Board of Regents knows that UW System produces wonderful history majors. <laughs> um, I can't stand up and do this by myself, so I, I brought some members of my department. I hope you'll come up and join me. And we also can't accept this without our Russian historian, so I hope that Professor Levinstein-Kevich will come up also. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank all of the regents very much. I, I used to think that what we did was reward enough and that we didn't need any public recognition, but this feels outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's my great privilege to chair a department of immensely talented, creative, unstoppable faculty who put student learning first, period, and who always wonder every morning when they come to work how we can get better at what we do. Um, just to introduce the people I have here, our Russian historian, Professor Levinstein Kevich, <laughs> uh, Professor Robert Goff, Early American History and the History of Wisconsin, Oscar Chamberlain, um, U.S. Constitutional History, um, John Mann, our public historian that you just heard about, and Professor T Patricia Turner, French History, and the major author of the Teaching American History Grants. I was asked to talk about a few things I'm proud of. Um, in fact, I think the letter said two. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to come up with four. Uh, I've been here for about a decade, and, and for that decade, we have had a curriculum that was absolutely dedicated to teaching students the history of the global society in which we live, and also of the multicultural nation in which we live. Um, we've also been very much engaged in student-faculty collaborative research, which is one of the marks of excellence of UW-Eau Claire. And what that means for the history department is a series of seminars beginning sophomore year during which students prepare to write and then write an original senior thesis that's mentored by the faculty member supervising the seminar and then also by another faculty member. And, and we are just immensely proud of this original research that our students do. We're also very proud of our work with K-12 through teachers. Um, most of this has been funded through the Teaching American History grants, but it's also funded through other grant programs, um, and, and some of it happens simply through National History Day, and, and we're just very proud of that. Um, that has led to the creation of a public history program, which is a very timely thing for a history department to do. Our students now can not only do outstanding historical research, but they can also present it to the public. And one thing that we're finding is that when K-12 teachers engage students in presenting history to the public, history becomes more real for them, and the research becomes more real too. Now, we couldn't do any of these things by ourselves. There aren't that many of us. And, and so what we've been able to do is create a wonderful set of collaborations. Um, I can't say enough about the Wisconsin Historical Society. This year they finally placed a field services representative in our department so that the Northern Field Services Office for the Wisconsin Historical Society is at UW Eau Claire in the History Department. And that person can help place our public history students in internships all over Northern Wisconsin. I also have to thank the Chippewa Valley Museum. It's an accredited professional museum that works collaboratively with us no matter what crazy ideas we come up with. And, and that's just fabulous. McIntyre Library is also wonderful. We have a fabulous library on the UW Eau Claire campus that has a professional archivist um, named Colleen McFarland who really should be up here with us today too. We, we could not do this without the library faculty. And finally, we have an amazingly supportive community in Eau Claire who turn out for all of our events, volunteer to judge National History Day, um, show up with all kinds of letters they've discovered in their attic that, that might be useful for our research um, and, and are just so supportive. So thank you all so very much. I, I have no idea what we'll do to top this, but we'll go figure it out. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to wait a little bit clear the room to try to feel Our next matter is the report of the Education Committee. Mr. President, <clears throat> I'm pleased to report the summary from, um, first of all, can I just say one thing? Don't, don't listen to Chuck when it's an invitation to have us rotate on and share this experience with other colleagues. We're, we're not that magnanimous. <laughs> anyway, I'm pleased to report the summary from yesterday's meeting of the Education Committee. I also want to note that our Education Committee as you will recall, also sponsored the uh, All Regions tutorial, uh, tutorial on charter schools. And it's my understanding that the board's minutes will reflect the rich discussion that came as a result of that item. <coughs> so the com our committee began with two engaging presentations, which I'd like to briefly describe. The first of which was rec uh, in recognition of 2006 as the year of stu uh, study abroad. As mentioned by President Walsh, we participated in a presentation in recognition of 2006 being the year of study abroad as decreed by the United States Senate and as reflected in Governor Doyle's proclamation. The committee, he the committee heard from Chancellor Betts and Brent Green, Director of the International Education Program from UW River Falls, and Terrence Miller, Director of International Education Programs from UW Milwaukee, about two UW Systems Exchange Programs, the Hessen Exchange Program with the German state of Hessen and the Kona Heck Program. <laughs> now, Kona Heck stands for, and I'm sure I butchered that, but anyway, you did. Uh, it, it <laughs> stands for the Consor Consortium for North American Higher Education Collaboration, and foster collaboration, cooperation, and community building among higher education institutions in the United States and Mexico, including student exchange. The Hessen Exchange Program is a state-to-state -state program that facilitates the exchange of faculty and students between the UW system campuses and campuses in the German state of Hessen. We also really enjoyed hearing from two students, uh, Nicole Lyon from UW Oshkosh, who participated in an internship program through the Hessen Exchange, and Ivan Luna, a student from Mexico who is studying at UW River Falls this semester through the Kona Heck <laughs> and I got to say, these two students were absolutely yeah, impressive. Um, so we know that you know they're just going to be outstanding uh, once they've completed their education, if that is such a thing that ever happens. Um, <laughs> meaning that lifelong learning <laughs> journey that we're all still on. Um, study abroad participation rates for UW undergraduates have doubled over the last few years, between 1999 and 2005. And UW Milwaukee reported that their participation rate has increased 127% in five years, with students of color representing 10.4% of study abroad students. <coughs> UW River Falls also reported on a recent trip to India, which has led to the establishment of relationships with various universities in India and opportunities for faculty and stud student exchanges and collaborative research opportunities. About. Our second um, presentation was on distance learning, and it was the UW Platteville's niche, niche. The second, and this was one that, as you recall, had originally been scheduled for our Platteville visit, and we expressed our sincere appreciation for the patience with the, this delay, as exhibited by um, the Platteville team. Provost Carol Subutz, Don Drake, Executive Director of the Alternative Delivery Systems, 
Michael Anderson, Director of the School of Education, and Richard Schultz, Dean of Engineering, Mathematics, and Science from UW Platteville, explained that while UW Platteville resident students are largely traditional <coughs> students right out of high school, they realize the importance of reaching non-traditional students. Their main focus is offering complete degree programs in business, criminal justice, engineering, and project management. UW Platteville's distance learning programs have partnered with UW colleges, the Tech College system, and others to reach place-bound, non-traditional students and to serve employees of over 500 companies around the state. The Master of Science in Adult Education reaches out to Racine, Milwaukee, and other areas through its flexible format. And two-thirds of the students in the Racine, Milwaukee cohort are students of color. The collaborative engineering programs partner with UW Fox Valley and UW Rock County to address business and student needs through degree programs in electrical and mechanical engineering. These programs have been financially supported by the companies and provide employers with graduates who are committed to staying in the area. It's an exceptional model. So our third item that we discussed were revised faculty personnel rules for the UW Green Bay. <laughs> this was pretty much straightforward um, on a set of rules revisions that the UW Green Bay faculty um, process brought to our level. The revisions clarify the rules for non-renewals of provincial green faculty. Last August, the committee asked that a brief statement from the Office of General Counsel accompany each set of rules revisions brought before us for action. And actually, that was at the suggestion of Vice Chair Mike Spector. We um, found the letter um, to be most helpful, and I, it will be incorporated in future um, rule revision and approval changes. The committee was happy with the prototype, and all regions can expect this document in the future. I think I said that once in my own words. Okay, so the fourth item was appointments to the Oversight and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Fund for a Healthy Future. And with Dean Robert Golden's report to the full board yesterday served as a perfect introduction to the committee's next action. We approved two reappointments and two new appointments to the UW School of Medicine and Public Health Oversight and OAP, let's just call it OAP, of the Wisconsin Partnership Fund for a Healthy Future. We were also really pleased to see um, our friend, Regent Emeritus Patrick Boyle, who, has served as, who currently serves as the board's liaison to the OAP. As you'll recall, this committee is responsible for planning for and overseeing the use of funds allocated for public health through the Wisconsin Partnership Fund for a Healthy Future. The committee was very impressed by the credentials of these four individuals, each of whom will be appointed for four-year terms. Our fifth item was um, difficult. We actually thought about refusing to vote on it. The authorization to recruit senior vice president to replace <laughs> irre irreplaceable core men. But then we realized that uh, we did have a duty um, <laughs> to, to, to move on. And so the committee recognizes the significant role this position plays in the UW system and discussed the importance of reaching a common understanding of the responsibilities for this position. And actually, we very much appreciated the comments of Senior Executive Vice President Don Nash on the consultation underway with faculty, academic staff, chancellors, and provosts on this position. Committee Vice Chair Mike Spector invited President Riley to take this opportunity to take a fresh look at the position description <coughs> um, for this uh, position, taking into consideration, obviously, all of the stakeholders, and including um, CORA. We know this is Kevin's intent, and as a matter of fact, although he wasn't able to join us at the time we, uh, this item came up for discussion, I invite his comments now. Yes, thank you, Regent Davis. Uh, just to give the, uh, the, me the other members of the board who are not at the uh, Education Committee meeting some sense of this, we've uh, already begun a process of extensive consultation uh, on this issue. We've talked with uh, faculty reps, some with the chancellors, with the senior leadership team in the Office of, uh, of Academic Affairs at System. Um, talk some with the chair of the education committee uh, and we will be working with the entire education committee on this as our through the process as our procedures uh, call for and I can talk more about that if you like uh, scheduled I'm I believe I'm scheduled to talk with the provosts as a group next week about this they're the the, uh, the group of senior officers in the system who work most 
uh, intimately with the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Uh, be talking with the academic staff reps and with the uh, student uh, uh, reps shortly as well. Uh, I'm very interested in what uh, all of these groups and, and any uh, uh, regions have to say about uh, what the system level academic affairs functions ought to be and do for the future. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll form up plans as we move forward with this search, assuming that you authorize us to indeed move forward with it. We'll form up uh, plans that, that uh, will have the, uh, the position in the office be and do what we need to do for the, for the future. So uh, we thank you for your interest. And uh, uh, we have a, uh, a draft position description that will begin circulating around to, to those groups and others for reactions that you may have, uh, presuming that you authorize us to move forward with the search this morning. And that will be part of my consent agenda. So Good. Not, not Mike, did you want to? No, thank you very much. Okay. All right. And um, like um, Regent Salas, we'll take the opportunity next month to express our profound appreciation for Cora's leadership. And it has been profound. Um, our next item <clears throat> was to hear the institutional report on general education at UW Whitewaters as a at Whitewater, accompanied by a brief summary of UW-Whitewater's NCA Higher Learning Commission's accreditation. UW-Whitewater was visited by the HLC in 2006 and subsequently received an unconditional 10-year reaccreditation. This is um, outstanding and we commend UW-Whitewater for this extraordinary achievement. Provost uh, Dick Tef Telfer described a number of the positive comments received from the HLC, including the high quality of instruction in spite of increased workloads, strong relations with community partners, and excellent strategic planning to help address budget cuts. The committee was very impressed with Whitewater's general education program, and um, they have some excellent and innovative course offerings in place and a good assessment program to evaluate their students' learnings. As part of Senior Vice President Cora Merritt's report, we then undertook um, a lively, robust discussion uh, presentations on the guidelines and criteria for the proposed expansion of WTCS <coughs> liberal arts and pre-professional offerings. Cora reminded us of our stewardship role, that is, that Wisconsin statutes require that any broadening of Wisconsin Technical College System's collegiate transfer programs must be first approved by both the WTCS and the UW boards. Her opening remarks were followed by presentations on the specifics. Larry Rubin, Assistant Vice President for Academic and Student Services and our primary transfer coordinator, covered the background and overview of transfers both within and into the UW system. And he stressed the growth in WTCS's transfer students in the last 10 years due to changes in transfer policies of a positive nature. There are also far fewer letters from students, so much. parents, and state leaders on transfer problems <laughs> because of increased coordination, support, and articulation agreements being in place. Kathy Cullen, Vice President for Teaching and Learning at WTCS, then gave the committee an overview of the different types of degrees offered by WTCS institutions and the process used by WTCS to develop and approve collegiate transfer programs and the WTCS board's process for approving its guidelines and criteria for the expansion um, of offerings. Ron Singer, Associate Vice President for Academic and Student Services, concluded by discussing the role of the UW Systems Board in this process and reviewing the draft criteria for approval of WTCS um, completed transfer programs and we received that we've all received in our materials. The committee applauded the history of collaboration between the WTCS and UWS on transfer issues. Several committee members, including uh, Regent King, King raise a number of questions, including language on the efficiency and effectiveness in the draft criteria for approval of WTCS collegiate <laughs> transfer programs, further explanation of pre-professional programs, and more information on how UW colleges see these guidelines. And in fact, all members of the committee, um, as part of that lively, robust discussion, raised a number of issues, um, and not of a negative nature, but basically just wanting to make sure that we understood the full impact um, and the platform, if you will, for this uh, upcoming decision. And as a result of these questions needing to be addressed, the committee agreed to table the resolution until the December meeting. 
So I now have a consent agenda to all of and includes three resolutions for our action. Resolution 11C, approving the amendments to the UW Green Bay faculty personnel rules. Resolution 11D, approving the appointments to the Oversight and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Fund. And Resolution 11E, authorizing reluctantly the recruitment of a Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Is there a request to move any request to remove any item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Mr. President, let me conclude my report by noting that the Education Committee meeting adjourned at 3.31 p.m. <laughs> I think she's rubbing it in. <laughs> yes, Mr. Regent, Bra uh, Regent Bradley. Uh, Kevin, I'd just like to ask, what will be the, the explanation to the technical school board about the, uh, the, the delay till December? I, I just think how that is presented to them is very important. Could I sure. just, yeah. um, real quick, because I think one thing that, and definitely Kevin should respond, but we did have uh, Dan Clancy present during this meeting. We've had conversations with Dan before and after the meeting. Um, obviously, our president um, was also in support with uh, the nature of that. So that, I just wanted to give you that feeling. I didn't know, you know that Kevin. Dan was there. Yeah, he was present. He was there, and we talked to him before and after. So if you still want Kevin to respond. Only if he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll rely on President Keene to carry that message back. And we did uh, have a good conversation, as, as uh, Denise said, with uh, uh, President Clancy right uh, after uh, the decision was made. And, and he seemed comfortable. Uh, uh, Regent Keene and I have talked afterwards. I think uh, we will have our, our mutual staff working hard uh, to lead up to the December meeting so that we have uh, something substantive in, in the way of further agreement about a framework uh, as we move forward with the ongoing relationship around these new programs coming forward from the tech colleges so that uh, uh, the December meeting we can make some decisions in that regard. So I think the message uh, that, that I think we want to send back to the, the tech colleges generally is uh, we're on this, we're working well together, uh, this is moving forward in a way that I think will, will benefit the students, which is the bottom line purpose for which we're working together. So I don't know, Mary, if that... And, and I would just add, it, it was tabled to the December meeting for action. And so I think that's a very positive message. Um, and I explained that even though I've been working with this issue for over a year, other committee members have not. And so it's just the need to have more questions answered and further detail in the um, criteria outlined so that everyone was comfortable. Because once the criteria is set, that, you know, then we will begin to look at actual transfer degrees. So it was a um, good mutual agreement among the committee. So we are moving forward in December. Thank um, you. Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to call on Regent Pruitt for a report of the business, finance, and audit. <coughs> Uh, Mr. President, with your permission, the Business Finance and Audit Committee uh, will be initiating a new reporting procedure to the board this month. Um, we, I will be sharing the responsibility um, with another member of the committee in reporting uh, what we did. Uh, this will have many benefits, perhaps the most uh, important being that you and my colleagues will hear less of me and more of others. Uh, which I assume, uh, if for no other reason, that is both a laudable objective and one that will have your complete and full-throated support um, going forward. So I will begin. Is that all right? Uh, it's, a pro it's fine, except uh, so long as she shows a little more respect for the president <laughs> other than yesterday. I will certainly. Uh, we will just leave that where it lies. Um, <laughs> The, bus <laughs> the uh, Business Finance and Audit Committee met in joint session with the Fiscal Planning and Funding Committee to hear a discussion of renewable energy alternatives for UW institutions. Uh, this discussion uh, will be described, I am sure, in, in great detail and with great yeah, flourish the, uh, by the uh, <laughs> Fiscal Planning and Funding Committee. Uh, after the joint session, 
uh, the committee reconvened um, and we began a discussion about the challenges related to recruiting and retaining uh, our faculty and academic uh, leaders. Uh, it was really the beginning of a discussion surrounding the 2007-2009 pay plan recommendations. Uh, we're all aware of the importance of the University of Wisconsin remaining competitive in what is a very clearly a national market uh, when it comes to recruiting and retaining faculty, academic staff, and senior academic leaders. The quality of our institutions, and I know this board understands this completely, depends upon the quality of our employees <laughs> and the quality of our leaders. Uh, in the last three years, uh, President Riley reminded us uh, we have lost six of our chancellors to other colleges and universities. Every single one has left for a substantially higher compensation package. We have also lost uh, substantial numbers of our experienced faculty and staff to other university systems across the country. Uh, we're all aware of the financial limitations and the financial realities of what we face in the state of Wisconsin and with the budgets of the past and potentially some uh, uh, concern about budgets going forward. Uh, we know we won't close these gaps overnight, but it is clearly, uh, and President Riley reminded us of this, uh, that one of our most important responsibilities as regents is to make this an, uh, a focus uh, going forward. President Riley remarked that he met with the Compensation Advisory Committee in April and again last month to engage members of the faculty and academic staff in a review of compensation relative to peers and to listen and learn of the recruitment and retention challenges that the institutions face. He noted that by the end of the current biennium, our average faculty salaries will be 8.5% behind the peer median, academic staff will be 12% behind, and academic leaders will be more than 16% behind their peer medians. Uh, Associate Vice President for Human Resources Al Chris presented paid plan information for unclassified staff data was also provided about where the institutions stand compared to their respective peer groups and recent pay plans for UW employees were compared to those of other state employees. Uh, we then heard from a panel of campus representatives who presented information on the specific challenges faced by a number of campuses and um, it was one of those presentations that obviously as we all do with, with various committees one wished that the entire board could hear or at least uh, and potentially as we go forward we may be able, I, I would hope, to provide some additional sort of communication because it, it was terribly revealing to hear from representatives of, from UW-Madison, UW-Milwaukee, uh, UW-Whitewater, and UW-Stevens Point talk about uh, the challenges that they are facing in retaining faculty. At Madison last year, um, there were 116 outside offers to faculty. Um, at the same, it was uh, a similar, sort of probably close to a similar percentage at UW-Milwaukee. Uh, it is very clear that our faculty, and particularly our more senior faculty, uh, are targets uh, from other states and other university systems. And it is also clear, uh, as a number of our uh, presenters reminded us, that the best strategy to uh, prevent losing them uh, is to prevent them from looking in the first place. Uh, and that is where issues related to pay plan and compensation and faculty retention funds and providing chancellors and others and provost uh, resources uh, becomes even more important. Um, the committee also heard from representatives from TAUP and action on a recommended pay plan for the 2007-2009 biennium will be requested at the December meeting. This was the, the first of a two-part process. We then uh, moved on to to consideration of salary adjustments for chancellors at UW Platteville, UW Stout, and UW Superior, and for a provost at UW Platteville. Uh, last February, uh, the board endorsed a new process whereby uh, we would periodically review and assess uh, individual chancellors and provost salaries based on um, looking at whether there is a need for an adjustment to recognize competitive salaries or to correct salary inequities. Uh, the committee discussed and approved salary adjustments for chancellors at UW Platteville, Stout, and Superior, and for a provost at UW Platteville under this new process. Uh, President Riley reminded us that leadership matters, and this is a tangible expression that we get back. Uh, the resolution uh, will be presented at the end of my report as a consent resolution. <coughs> I also note 
that in keeping with President Walsh and President Riley's commitment to openness and transparency, uh, this was done in an open session of the committee, and it is obviously being done in an open session of the board. Um, I now turn to my colleague, Regent Eileen conley Kiesler, to continue the report of the Business Finance and Audit Committee. Um, we discussed the LAB audit on um, personnel policies and practices. Vice President Durkin stated that in October, the Legislative Audit Bureau released its evaluation of personnel policies and practices in the UW system. Ms. Durkin stated that the audit focused on six key areas, sick leave reporting, sick leave conversion upon retirement, vacation reporting, limited and concurrent appointments, the use of consultant title and, and faculty sabbaticals, the committee reviewed the audit recommendations and discussed the next steps in the process, including the Legislative Audit Committee hearing on November 29th and the final report due June 1st, 2007. Ms. Durkin no noted that a special region committee has been formulated to provide uh, advice to Associate Vice President Chris regarding the planned UW system response to the audit recommendations. We were happy and honored to have President uh, Region President Walsh with us yesterday. He did state he had a few concerns with the LAB audit, um, particularly around the use of concurrent and the B word we were never supposed to say again, um, the backup positions. Uh, we then talked about the academic performance standards and the UW system athletic directors and coaches job performance evaluations. We discussed specific recommendations to strengthen the extent to which student athletic academic stand standards are included in athletic directors and coaches contracts and performance evaluations. This um, <coughs> included requiring athletic directors and head coaches at all UW institutions to promote the academic success of student <coughs> athletes and requiring UW institutions with Division I athletic programs to submit an annual report. Um, the resolution was tabled at this point because it, uh, Regent Randall, who really requested the review, wasn't present at the time. So we'll wait and take a look at this again. We then discussed um, the <coughs> we discussed a scope of a potential analysis of policy options for the Board of Regents on oversight of information technology projects. This certainly came up over the issues regarding the IT um, problems that the university faced and decided we were not going to go back and look at everything that happened <coughs> on at IT, but we we're going to look forward and we we're going to put together a policy on how the Board of Regents will deal with future projects in IT um, and uh, what we need to look for, how we're going to set benchmarks, and how we're going to proceed with committees. So it really is an analysis of, of some of the things that happened and a policy recommendation that will come uh, in the future, and that certainly was endorsed by the committee. Uh, just a couple of additional housekeeping matters that the committee discussed. Vice President Durkin reported that total awards of gifts and grants uh, were about $400 million for the quarter, uh, uh, representing a slight decrease from prior years. The committee deferred our um, consideration of the role of the Finance Committee and Committee Goals for 2006-2007 to, to a subsequent meeting. Uh, when we'll be looking ahead to 2010 and beyond. Uh, Vice President Durkin reported that um, in order to make uh, the board meetings more efficient, UW system staff, including legal counsel, have been reviewing a series of these statutorily required reports that are brought before the committee and, and evaluating whether in some cases it is uh, more efficient to simply send those reports out to committee members in advance in writing and, and uh, then make that make them available for review at the time of the committee. Um, we're sad, uh, it, following on on uh, Regent Davis's uh, sadness. The committee of the the Business and Finance Committee is also sad to report uh, the departure of Audit Director Ron Yates. Um, this will be his last Board of Regents meeting as he is moving to Oregon to be with his family. Um, this will be a huge loss for both the university and the business finance and audit committee, but, but we certainly wish Ron and his family all the best. Finally, uh, the uh, committee reconvened at the annual trust funds public forum in Granger Hall. In addition to committee members Smith, Conley, Keesler, and myself, Regents Crane and Seminus and Regent-elect Shields were also present 
The committee heard from seven speakers, which were, which was considerably fewer than we had heard in previous years. Uh, they were divided uh, in favor and against asking the board to divest from companies that do business in or with Israel. One speaker also urged us to encourage the State Investment Board to divest from companies doing business in Sudan. Um, the Business Finance and Audit Committee unanimously approved the following resolution, which I now present as a consent item. On behalf of the Business Finance and Audit Committee, I move adoption of Resolution 1.2.B2, consideration of salary adjustments for chancellors at UW Platteville, UW Stout, and UW Superior, and for a provost at UW Platteville. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, you know, one of the, the more efficient, these meetings would not be efficient at all unless Judy Temby was running them and, and, and prodding me to make sure I do things right. And she correctly pointed out, uh, well, Chuck was talking, that we are, went out of order, that we didn't uh, do the planning and um, uh, uh, when we should have done it second. And, and, and what she really meant was, David, don't forget to do it. Yeah. And the reason I didn't, and I'm not going to take the blame from Judy because I care what she thinks of me, is that Jesus was not in the room. So if you're ready to go, Jesus, uh, well, report of the physical planning and funding committee out of order, but go ahead. Mr. President, as uh, Regent Pruitt alluded to it, uh, in his uh, opening remarks, uh, when the Business and Finance Committee uh, jointly meets with our committee, we usually meet in this wonderful sunlit room rather than uh, the <laughs> cave downstairs on the 15th floor. And uh, the problem was that I uh, opened the meeting, uh, I, was, I didn't have the uh, gavel that you have in front of you. I slammed my uh, uh, hand on the table to call the meeting to order, and I think the reason that uh, Regent Connie Keeser is over there is because there's paper yeah. <laughs> so, no, all over the table. So it's a rocky uh, a start to our uh, joint meeting with the Business and Finance Committee, Mr. President. But we met to discuss the renewable energy alternatives for the UW uh, institutions. Assistant Vice President David Miller informed the uh, committees that the uh, Governor's Executive Order 145 conserved Wisconsin directed the creation of high performance building standards and a state facility energy efficiency goal of a 10% usage reduction per gross square foot by fiscal year 8 and a 20% usage reduction by fiscal year 10. Mr. Miller also discussed the renewable electrical energy goals of the recent Wisconsin Act 141, which directs that at least 10% of annual electrical energy uh, usage be from renewable resources by the end of 2007 and 20% by the end of 2011. The governor requested that three campuses be chosen to participate in a pilot program to go off the grid in five years, that those campuses be capable of acquiring or producing renewable energy equivalents to their consumption. Campuses were evaluated for their suitability for inclusion in this pilot program and four not three uh, campuses, as the governor had requested, were selected, and they are as follows. UW Green Bay, UW Oshkosh, UW River Falls, and UW Stevenson Point. Miller mentioned that renewable or green energy options that could serve as replacements for fossil fuels currently burned in our heating plants and that electrical energy could be purchased as green power from state utilities or generated green power from wind turbine uh, 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 generators. 
I was thoroughly enjoying myself here in the boardroom when we ran uh, out of things to discuss and Regent Pruitt was anxious to get on with his meeting and we were marched off to the uh, 15th floor where the Physical and Planning and Funding Committee convened and the minutes of the October committee meeting were approved. The following four resolutions, Mr. President, were unanimously approved by the Physical Planning and Funding Committee and now are presented as consent agenda items. Resolution 13C, brought by the UW Eau Claire, requests authority to sell a parcel of land to the Department of Transportation for multi-purpose trail projects being constructed by DOT. And Regent Bradley, would you please restrain uh, 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 President Walsh because this uh, uh, transfer of land it has four place value. There's a, there's a decimal point, there are two zeros and two digits, and that's 10,000 of an acre of land being transferred. We don't want any disruptions to the uh, report. And I know that he's going to use, he's to use uh, 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 a reporting time and transfers of land of that magnitude. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we are working with the Department of, uh, of Transportation to develop this multi-purpose trail. Uh, 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 Mr. Vice President, and we want the. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, actually, uh, uh, Professor Coker is available. Still, uh, uh, he is outside the boardroom. Uh, 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 if, in fact, there is any need for the region president to uh, tra uh, uh, translate that fraction in or that percent into a fraction. I think that's the reason why uh, he pays so much for his uh, uh, silk ties, because uh, when it comes to red dot sales, you know, you get the regular <laughs> percent reduction, and then in addition with the red dot sales, you get an additional percent of reduction. It just can't be enough. He pays the full price for those beautiful ties that he, uh, that he wears. Resolution 13D requests authority to increase the project budget and construct the new engineering building at UW Platteville. This project will relieve overcrowding, <coughs> overcrowding in the College of Engineering, Math and Science and Technology based programs as well as provide space for the enrollment growth uh, of the Tri-State Initiative. We thank uh, uh, the Chancellor for bringing, bringing this uh, very beautiful colorful uh, drawings to that draft room and I hope that others can be added in the future. Chancellors are, are free to bring any uh, uh, thing to life and up that uh, home downstairs. <laughs> Resolution 13E seeks authority to exchange a parcel of land for agricultural purposes at UW River Falls. This exchange will result in additional farmland for use by the College of Agricultural Food and Environmental Sciences. And fellow regions, there is a map in your uh, original package of your agenda items that shows this transfer of land and uh, it is a wonderful uh, benefit to the, uh, to the uh, farm. I recently uh, uh, went to the uh, 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 groundbreaking of the uh, dairy uh, center at uh, River Falls and there happened to be some land that had just been tilled uh, and after spending 10 years of my life uh, uh, harvesting uh, uh, produce on uh, many uh, uh, soils throughout the Midwest, this is one of the finest soils that I've ever seen. You could throw any seed in there and it would grow. And in fact, what, it, what, uh, what uh, this land that we're exchanging for is tillable land that can be used for production for our little friends in the dairy industry that we're going to be housing in those new uh, uh, facilities. Resolution 13F request approval to construct all agency maintenance and repair projects at various campuses. These projects include roof replacements, space renovations, a utility replacement, and the rekeying of a campus access center. And if you'll notice in your red folder is that the uh, that the uh, there is a label of revise uh, on your items. Actually, there is no change. Uh, uh, to the options that are there, uh, none certainly that you're going to be voting on. Uh, what we did under this item, or that is under the maintenance and repair projects, we removed that project of the Chiller uh, project from the uh, University of Eau Claire, and that's all that that's in there, and that's why it's labeled revised. 
Secondly, there was uh, an omission in the uh, uh, UW Whitewater Phase Two athletic uh, multi-sport facility. It includes a thirty-five dollars and fifty-two cent segregated fee spread over a three-year period of time that had been uh, 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 approved by the students uh, earlier this uh, year. These four items, uh, Mr. President, were passed unanimously by the committee and I now move adoption of resolution 13C, D, E, and F. Is there a second? There is a second. Is there a request to remove any item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Mr. President, Assistant uh, uh, Vice President David Miller reported that the Building Commission approved about $10,600,000 for projects at their October meeting. The funding breakdown for those projects was $6,400,000 for general fund supported borrowing and $2,800,000 of program revenue and 1,400,000 give and grant funds. Mr. President, this concludes the report of the Physical Planning and Funding Committee. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any additional resolutions? Are there any communications, petitions, or memorials? Yes, yes we are. I just Please. wanted to uh, mention to the evening that I had the uh, privilege to, I guess, more or less represent the regions uh, and give a speech to the Global Education 2006 conference, and, and we went there as well. Uh, this is, these are all of the faculty and others from not only the University of Wisconsin system, but the private colleges and others. Uh, who met at their annual meetings and uh, mm -hmm. sure. I talked about international education and I had the opportunity to look at uh, what, uh, what the University of Wisconsin looks like these days as far as foreign students. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're <coughs> and I this, this past week, I, was, I spent the week in Ankara, Turkey, and on Wednesday I had uh, lunch with the Reform Committee of the Parliament. I've been working with them on and off for 10 years. And I couldn't help but think that when I looked at our statistics that how relatively few foreign students we have from, I mean the foreign students we have are relatively homogeneous. Um, I would hope that one meeting we would have a some time to look at what our international educational system looks like and see if we shouldn't have some type of a strategy um, that needs to have Wisconsin students study abroad. But if we're going to have so few international students in the system, I, I think we should look at maybe we should have some type of a strategy <laughs> where they come from, but also to help the campuses. This is difficult you know, business. When we were in Platteville, after a meeting, I had a chance to talk to the director of the China program. It's a monumental effort that they make to these students come, mm -hmm. come there. Virtually all the visas are, <coughs> are turned down. And they have to call the congressman. The congressman has to call the consular office in the embassy. Oh. Students have to go a second time to get the visa. <coughs> spend money, they have to guarantee that they're here, guarantee they go home. So I would, I would hope that we would, uh, we would do that uh, at some future meeting. The last uh, thing I want to mention is that an old friend of mine, Doug Mel, who uh, is the editor of the Eau Claire Leader Telegram, is now the new director of communications at Stealth and Holly's Technical NBC, and I want to congratulate him and them. Uh, thank you. Um, any other comments? Um, I, I, Tom, I, I don't know what the word dismal means, but I was surprised to find that the freshman class at UW-Madison is 4% international. But you're talking about the system. Any other questions or comments? Any unfinished business, additional business? 
seeing none, we will take a five-minute recess and then move into closed session as noticed. Five minutes.